In Las Vegas, more than 35 million people try to strike it rich every year. Most leave empty-handed, or worse. But cheats in Vegas are always looking for new ways to beat the system, and Vegas security is just as committed to stopping them. Cheaters cheat because basically they have the feeling that I am special because I can do this. They'll say, there's an opportunity for me to make money. They'll go home and they'll practice it, practice it, practice it, come in and beat us. But every time the cheaters think they have the system beat, the system gets better. These are the crimes that push Vegas to up their game. These are the game changers. Cheaters have been around since gambling began in the United States. In the Old West, you had to see the cheat to catch it. And justice was swift. Today, thousands of cameras police every moment of every game. That means cheaters have to be slicker than ever. The technology just seems to be never ending. And the biggest challenge for us is to keep up with that technology. It's a high-tech game of cat and mouse. But every once in a while, a criminal comes along who's able to fly completely under the radar and, in the process, changes the game forever. These men and women would justify, you know, stealing in, in all sorts of ways. The casino industry is dishonest or some other nonsense, and they would talk themselves into being okay with stealing. Keeping track of the city's most notorious cheats is the job of the Nevada Gaming Control Board. Their version of the FBI's most wanted list, called the Black Book, was created in 1960. It had six people that were originally put in it, and they were all organized crime figures. And these people were not allowed to enter any casino. But as the old mobsters died off, a new generation of tech-savvy cheats took over, and they were added to the list. You have to be a threat to the casino industry, and there's about 37 or 38 in the Black Book right now. Most are career criminals who cheated the casinos for years before being caught. Whenever you make an arrest on someone from a law enforcement standpoint, it's a success. So that's kind of how I view putting someone in the black book. Once you're in the book, you have the right to dispute it, but no one has ever won their way or, or litigated their way out of it. The only way you get out of the black book is to die. Then they take you out. One of the most notorious cheats to ever make the book targets the city's hardware. It is an ongoing war in the industry between uh, the manufacturers on the one side and the cheats on the other. Enter the city's biggest money makers. In Vegas, there are 120,000 working slot machines, one for every five residents. They're called one-armed bandits because they're responsible for more than 75% of casino profits. And with all that money sitting on the casino floor, slots are, and always have been, glittering beacons for cheats looking for a quick payout. From the earliest days, cheats have tried fooling the machines with slugs or coins attached to strings that could then be pulled back out. But as the machines became more sophisticated, so did the cheats. One of the most successful slot cheats of all time is a former TV repairman named Tommy Carmichael. For more than two decades, Carmichael designed tools that enabled him and other cheats to scam millions from slot machines. And every Vegas slot machine you see today was engineered with Tommy Carmichael in mind. The devices that Tommy Carmichael could create would allow a very surreptitious entry of a machine and a very surreptitious breaching of the security features of a machine that were successful and, and it worked in a large uh, population of the makes and models of slot machines out at that time. This is 62-year-old Carmichael. He agreed to sit down for this exclusive interview to reveal how he took Vegas for a ride. It was like a giant ATM. Uh, just wherever you wanted to go for vacation, you went to withdraw also. <laughs> 
The story begins in Carmichael's TV repair shop. A friend of his dropped by with a uh, what he told him was a cheating device to cheat slot machines. And it was called a top and bottom joint. Here's how the top and bottom joint works. In 1980, slots had come a long way from the earliest machines. Originally, slotted discs were attached to the ends of three spinning reels inside. To hit a jackpot, all of the slots had to line up perfectly. And that's how slot machines got their name. But on the newer machines, levers are attached to the spinning reels. These levers have metal contacts on the ends, which rest against a fixed board that's also covered with contacts. The contacts are wired to a circuit board, and when a jackpot is won, a circuit completes and turns on the motor of the hopper, which dispenses the money. The cheating device brought into Carmichael's shop that day hot wires the hopper's motor, triggering a payout. This device, the top and bottom joint, comes in two parts. The bottom tool is made from a short piece of guitar string. It was a small wire that went in the bottom left corner of the, uh, of the machine, and it went up against a circuit board that was in there. The wire draws the current from the circuit board and sends a low wattage of electricity running through the slot machine. Then the top tool, a piece of metal shaped like the number nine, is inserted into the coin slot. This completes an electrical circuit powerful enough to activate the hopper that dispenses money. And the coins come flooding out. Carmichael's friend is making money hand over fist in Vegas while Carmichael is barely scraping by in Tulsa. He wants in on the action. So he flies to Nevada to try his luck with his friend's device. In 1980, security cameras aren't around to capture his activities. In fact, they won't be installed throughout casinos for more than nine years. Carmichael sits down at a slot machine, inserts the top and bottom joint, and suddenly, Tommy Carmichael has a new career, cheating Vegas. Carmichael begins commuting to Sin City to run his scam. The machines held about $75 back then. On a good day, by working all day long, you might make $2,000 a day, which was good money. Carmichael's daily take is the equivalent of more than $5,000 today. I'd stay out there and let somebody else run the shop. I'd be out there a couple months at a time, but when I'd come back, it seemed like the shop never made any money. So I finally just shut the shop down completely and, and moved out there and started from that point, actually. Carmichael begins living large. He makes and buys new friends. You know, you got Vegas, and it's designed to separate you from your money, which it's very good at. So even though you're making larger money, uh, you're also spending larger money. We'd go to the show. We had some pretty good dinners. For me, $1,500, $1,800 for a meal is uh, pretty good for three, four or five people. He found a way to make money faster, and he didn't mind and probably enjoyed being a criminal. And so he decided it was worth the risk. Beating the machines were never the problem. It was the people around you. Without drawing attention, you need to get this money out of the machine without them noticing it or hearing it or appearing uh, that you're doing anything. That was the more complicated part of the whole, whole thing. To avoid suspicion, Carmichael never stays in one place too long. For five years, he hits casinos all over Vegas. Then, in 1985, the casinos catch some crooks using the top and bottom device. In response, slot machine manufacturers develop a way to recognize the surge of electricity the device creates. They were putting slow blow fuses in machines. And if you tried to cheat it with the wire in, it would blow this fuse and, and uh, it would shut down. Soon, these upgraded slots are everywhere. And for Carmichael, it looks like the end for his easy money. I was only making two or three, four hundred dollars a day if you were lucky, uh, because everything was shrinking down to nothing. 
To continue cheating, he has to find the old machines to prey on. He would uh, hit several slot machines in one casino at a time and empty them. Um, and this brought suspicion on him. On July 4th, 1985, Tommy Carmichael gets caught cheating while playing a slot machine near the strip. Enforcement agents from the Nevada Gaming Control Board arrest him. I had the tools on me. And when they searched me, they asked me, what's this? And I said, well, I believe you know. And uh, that was pretty much it. Carmichael is in serious trouble. Cheating, especially using a device to cheat, is a felony punishable by up to six years in prison for your first offense. Carmichael is sentenced to five years. But while most people find their careers on hold during a prison stay, Tommy Carmichael uses it as a breeding ground for his next big scam. Prison is a situation you pick your own friends. And there were slot uh, players there, and so we all kind of hung out together. One of these slot cheats is a man named Michael Balsamo. Balsamo has been in and out of prison since 1980. Michael Balsamo was a career criminal. That was his life. That was his lifestyle. Um, and he had pretty much dedicated himself to cheating the casino industry. Carmichael and Balsamo realize they have a lot in common. They were kind of a loose association in the sense that uh, one helped the other out, and vice versa. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. And they started devising a, a plan of getting together when they got out of prison. In 1987, Tommy Carmichael is the first to be released. His parole stipulated that he had to return to Tulsa and stay out of Vegas. Carmichael has no intention of complying. But since his TV business is long gone, he needs a cover. He makes a deal with a local contractor. He had a construction site, and I was supposed to be in a salesman for the construction site. So he was writing me a check, and I would turn it in as my salary. But I actually was living in Las Vegas. And every time I had to make a, a appearance from probation, I would actually fly from Vegas to Tulsa here and uh, make my appearance, and then I get back on plane, go back home to Vegas. <laughs> While he waits for Michael Balsamo to get out of jail, Carmichael cases out the casinos. Since his old tools no longer work, Carmichael needs a new one that will fool the latest generation of slot machines. He develops his boldest con yet, impersonating a casino owner. He would go to the actual manufacturers, walk in, uh, make himself sound like he was some sort of a person in the market to buy some new slot machines, and the salespeople would open up the doors, would take things apart, and show it to him. He would talk to engineers at trade shows. They'd show him the guts of the machine. For Carmichael, two things are now clear. One, hot wiring the hopper will not be an option. And two, in order for him to even figure out how to beat this machine, he'll need to buy one. The Nevada regulatory system allows for the sales of slot machines. There are stores where you can go buy a slot machine. Anybody can buy a slot machine. Problem is, the machine costs a thousand bucks, and Carmichael is broke. And so is Michael Balsamo, who also just got paroled. They decide to raise the cash together by doing what they know. They travel all over Nevada, looking for the last of the old machines that they can still cheat. We actually went and played the top and bottom joint, the old tool that we history on. We actually played nickels in order to get enough money to buy a new machine. Once he has it, Carmichael gets to work. Tommy Carmichael had the ability to take apart a slot machine, interrogate its security features, and develop techniques to sidestep them. Carmichael soon realizes that the new machine has a weak point, the counter that regulates the amount of coins that will be paid out. He discovers that the counter can be overrun by tripping a tiny micro switch deep in the machine. With the counter out of commission, the machine just keeps spitting out money. But Carmichael must create a tool that can access this switch. No easy feat. It took about six months to really come up with something really good on it and uh, it was called a slider. It was made out of a concrete trowel, 
and it was, it was about 11 and a half inches long, and it was, it was thin metal. It went through an air hole in the machine. Once inside, the slider has to slip underneath a secondary security door, then turn 10 degrees to engage the micro switch. But if Carmichael builds the tool with a fixed curve, it will get hung up on the hundreds of wires inside before ever reaching the door. This is a problem. But Carmichael has a stroke of inspiration. He threads piano wire through the nose of the tool so it can be adjusted after it passes beneath the door. It works. And it would slide into the micro switch and uh, stop the count whenever. So. The, the machine was always paying you, but it, it never knew how much it was paying you because you could actually keep it from counting. With the slider, Carmichael and Balsamo are back in business. They split up. Balsamo takes a slider and begins hitting casinos all over the country. Carmichael stays to work Vegas. That slider was making about $1,000 an hour because that's the speed that the machine would spit quarters out. With the new device, Carmichael is making money 10 times faster than he ever has before. And for the next two years, he enjoys all the spoils of his craft. But then, in 1989, the casinos find a new tool as well. Advancements in security camera technology mean that cameras can now be installed anywhere. And in Vegas, this means everywhere. Casinos are now able to closely monitor all aspects of gaming, including slot machines. For Carmichael and Balsamo, avoiding the cameras becomes the number one priority. They would case an establishment. They would look for obstructions with cameras because the marketing department, they would hang signs. They would make the place beautiful. They would put up flowers. Well, all of a sudden, you know, some of the best cameras for a particular area were masked. Well, the Tommy Carmichaels of the world would come into a casino and that's what they were looking for. Carmichael gets away with it for a year. But then, in 1990, surveillance officers notice him acting suspiciously at a machine. They call in agents from the Nevada Gaming Control Board who follow Carmichael home and stake out his apartment building. They were sitting in the parking lot and was going to try to catch me in the casino. But Carmichael gets a lucky break. And for some reason, that night, they pulled off me to go do something else. And when they came back the next day, I was gone. I had moved into a house. And of course, we were getting everything under different names and everything. So when they came back, I had disappeared on them. It's a close call. Carmichael will have to be more careful in the future. Months later, casinos unveil the latest slots designed to protect the money counter. Overnight. Carmichael's slider becomes obsolete. In the game of cheats versus casinos, the casinos are back on top. But once again, Carmichael isn't willing to give up the fight. I was asked one time, did I ever feel guilty about, about taking the money from the casinos? And I have actually asked myself, I said, you, you know, you're, you try to reason these things out, and I'm thinking, well, Honestly, do I? And I, I felt, no, I don't. The gaming industry is so misleading with cards or live type gaming. It's happening in front of you, and you got some kind of fair chance. When it comes to slots, you have no chance. In 1990, Carmichael is ready to cheat again, but there's a problem. His cheating device is useless. The slot's mechanical counters have been replaced by state-of-the-art optic sensors. This optic was a little light beam, and what it did it had a transmitter, and it would transmit a beam across to the receiver, and the coin would pass through this light, and that was how it would count the money. Once the machine has counted the allotted payout, it stops the flow of coins. So I came up with a tool that actually went up in there with a little light on it and supplied a beam of light to the receiver so that when the coin passed, the machine never knew it. As long as the light was lit, the machine was not counting coins as they came out of the machine. 
so they got a lot of coins that they weren't entitled to. Carmichael dubs his new cheating device the light wand. And with it, the game has changed again, this time in his favor. Carmichael also realizes that he can make more money outside the casino by selling light wands. His customers, fellow cheats and hustlers. To make one probably cost you two or three dollars. He would sell them for 10 or $12,000, quite a markup. <laughs> With the illicit sales of light wands, plus his own slot cheating, Carmichael is making more money than ever before. Oh, it was fun. It was a lot of fun, but nothing but uh, Disneyland, more or less. It was just a great big party most of the time. Tommy Carmichael's operation was a huge threat to the casino industry because he had so many cheaters involved using devices that he had created. They were stealing thousands and thousands of dollars a day. But Carmichael doesn't restrict himself to just cheating Vegas. He and his fellow scammers take the light wands on the road. They went all over the United States. And we'd drive up to Reno just for something to do, or Lake Tahoe, or Atlantic City, or Bluxy. He hung out with a drug crowd. They partied a lot. Remember, at their core, they're all con men. So they, it's not like they were buddy-buddy. Like, you know, it wasn't like they were a SEAL team where everybody trusted everybody. They were waiting for the knife in the back. But with so many people using Carmichael's light wands, there is more room for error. Light wands get stuck in machines and abandoned, only to be found by casino workers who hand them over to the Nevada Gaming Control Board. Here is the actual device. The black shrink tubing and black electrical tape are on there because we had to repair the device. It had become broken. Just now Julie's going to demonstrate how it's inserted through the coin return and positioned properly inside the game. And notice that the credit meter remains at six credits. Go ahead and cash out. Gaming agents create a video to show slot machine manufacturers how their machines have been compromised. So out of the six credits that the game thinks it paid out, these are the quarters that actually came out of the market. Obviously, significantly more than six. When they realized what was happening, the slot machine industry in introduced a delay. So if you heard a payout where the coins are following, about every six or seven seconds, there would be a slight delay. That delay was to outsmart the light beam. And so the light beam would stay on, and the delay would say, whoops, there should be no light. So the machine would shut down. The good guys are ahead again, but not for long. Carmichael modifies the light wand so the cheater can quickly turn off the device during the lag time. You just had an off and on switch. It was probably the most simple electrical circuit there is. Problem solved. It's back to business as usual. But then in 1996, alert surveillance officers finally catch Carmichael in the act. They noticed the money was coming out and the coin count was stopped of the machine. And here we go again. Here comes the security. Carmichael responds quickly. He pulls the light wand from the machine. And I sling the tool, and the tool goes clear across the casino. Well, the security all go over there, and they're looking all over the place for this tool. Can't find the tool. I told him, I said, there is no tool. But eventually, the light wand is found. It looks like Carmichael's luck has finally run out. Or has it? But they didn't have a case because where did that tool come from? I mean, is it mine or is it somebody else's they already had? Or I had a real good attorney. The prosecutor didn't feel there was sufficient evidence. The surveillance cameras were not on the machines enough to show him actually using the device in the machine. And authorities can't bust him on being in Las Vegas illegally since his parole expired four years earlier. So they dropped the charges against him. Carmichael has eluded justice, but once again, he's high on the radar at the Nevada Gaming Control Board. And his next misstep could easily be his last. 
Carmichael keeps his operation undercover. Then, in 1999, prison buddy Michael Balsamo re-enters the picture. He had done well for himself with Carmichael's cheating devices in the past, and he's eager to take advantage of Carmichael's latest technology. I think Tommy Carmichael would tell you that his fatal mistake was involving Michael Balsamo in his cheating group because Balsamo was kind of out of control and didn't really care what he did or how he did it. Balsamo has big plans. Armed with the light wand, he takes off for fresh casino territory throughout the U.S. Three months later, Balsamo's arrested and the light wand is confiscated and turned over to the FBI. An investigation is launched. When agents pull Balsamo's phone records, a number from Las Vegas keeps showing up, Tommy Carmichael's. The Nevada Gaming Control Board teams with FBI agents to tap Carmichael's phone. Yeah, I've got some incredible news. His days of cheating Vegas are coming to an end, but instead of pouncing right away, agents listen. Goes in through the coin slot. Carmichael, who has no idea authorities are onto him, is hard at work on a new cheating device. Because once again, slot machine manufacturers have caught up to his game-changing devices. They've just introduced machines called Ticket In, Ticket Out. The Ticket In, Ticket Out is when you win money. Instead of winning money, you get a ticket. And then you go and cash the ticket in. Carmichael's light wand is useless because the new slots have no coin release to manipulate. So he buys a ticket in, ticket out machine. Like the older slots, the machine still accepts bills and coins. So Carmichael devises a tool to trick the slot machine. He calls it the tongue. It was like a tongue depressor, and it actually went in where the coins went in. And what I was doing is I was taking over the coin acceptor with, a, uh, with this device. Carmichael's tool takes advantage of a flaw in the design of the machine's optical counting system. After a coin is put in, it falls straight down past a series of three lights. But Carmichael discovers he can trick the counter by moving his tool back and forth in front of the middle light. By blinking the center light, even if the other two were off, it wouldn't matter. It would think that coins were going through that fast stuck together. In less than a second, Carmichael's tongue tool triggers the machine into giving him hundreds of dollars worth of playing credits. It's the same as sticking money in. And now you cash it out, it's their problem. It's a new device and I've just created- Carmichael asks several of his fellow cheaters to test the device and help him work out the kinks. It's so called the tongue. We would follow them to these locations and watch them do it and steal money. It's a very backed off surveillance package, but we are doing it for a reason. We were building a bigger case. The tipping point, the reason that we dropped the hammer on them is that they had perfected and successfully tested a 25 cent coin in, uh, device and uh, they were upgrading the thing to a $5 coin in device. $5 machine can lose lots and lots of money in a very short period of time. It, it had the potential for millions of dollars worth of losses. We were gonna shoot it, making a couple million dollars a piece and, and then just retire. It, this one works completely different. Everything else went up. Carmichael still has no idea the feds are onto him. He is moving fast, so now the FBI has to act. When Carmichael flies to Atlantic City to score some easy cash, agents are waiting for him. He is caught red-handed with his tools and arrested. In 2000, the cheater who changed the security game by defeating every bit of technology he encountered pleads guilty to running an illegal gambling enterprise. Always looking for a good angle, Carmichael gets a lighter sentence by agreeing to show authorities how all his tools work. It was fun. I mean, 20 years, it was 20 years of just go to the wheels fall off, you know? But there are still dozens of other cheaters out there using the tools Carmichael created. And one of the boldest is Michael Balsamo, who has now taught his entire family to steal. Michael Balsamo was about Michael Balsamo, and he got a lot of people into hot water. 
In Las Vegas, Balsamo's wife, Stephanie, and his mother-in-law, Lavana, soon master the art of slot cheating. They use the light wand, preying on older casinos that haven't upgraded to the ticket-in machines yet. Surveillance footage shows the family in action. Stephanie was the one who was primarily doing the work. She was the one who was stealing, inserting the cheating device, um, collecting the money. The role of her mother was to sit next to her and have a very large purse put in a strategic position where it was a blocking agent so that the cameras could not see exactly what was going on. But all of it was orchestrated to draw attention away from the activity that they were doing, which was cheating. Stephanie Balsamo is extremely adept at using the light wand. It is literally uh, less than a second maneuver to get it from her purse out. You just see her hand go in her purse, typically come out of her purse and go into the hopper. If you watch it in real time, you will never see it. She is that good and that fast. When the video is slowed down, you can barely make out the edge of the light wand's handle. The way it's designed, it fits in the palm of her hand and it follows the curve of her fingers so that you don't see it. For at least a year, the Balsamo family wins the battle of cheats versus casinos, but the game is far from over. On April 28, 2006, Balsamo's wife Stephanie and her mother draw the suspicions of security officers all over Southern Nevada. In less than an hour, they had hit three separate casinos 10 miles apart and they had never ever lost, at least Stephanie never did. If she sat down at a machine, she walked away with buckets of coins. After reviewing hours of surveillance video, gaming officials finally have enough evidence to bust them. On June 5th, 2006, Michael Balsamo, his wife Stephanie, and his mother-in-law, Lavana, are arrested and charged with several counts of manufacturing and possessing a cheating device. In 2008, they all go to trial. Balsamo's mother-in-law is convicted but given probation. Balsamo's wife, Stephanie, is convicted and sentenced to between 16 and 32 years in prison. As for Michael Balsamo, he never made it to trial. While out on bail, he disappears. Michael Balsamo fled to Argentina, and we received reports from his family members that he passed away. There is some doubt that he, in fact, has died because he is such a scam artist. And so to this day, he still is listed as being alive. In Vegas, at least, Balsamo is out of the picture. And Carmichael is back in Oklahoma, banned from ever entering a casino in Nevada again. As for slots, they continue to evolve to become more secure. The slot machines are computerized today. They're computers. And so to cheat a slot machine this day and age, you pretty much have to be a computer expert, a hacker. And without question, there is someone like Tommy Carmichael trying to find a way to beat them. Tommy Carmichael and Michael Balsamo spent the better part of two decades cheating Vegas. There's no way to know for sure exactly how much they stole but experts believe it was in the millions. And in an ironic twist of fate, Tommy Carmichael, the slot cheat mastermind who is now banished to Tulsa, still isn't done with Vegas. He has one more hit. Carmichael develops and patents an anti-cheating device, which he tries to market to the casinos. It had been approved by gaming, and it had all the licensing and everything done to it. But as soon as they found out that I was the inventor of it, I said, no. Nah. The gaming industry, which had lost millions thanks to Carmichael and his inventions, wants nothing more to do with him. It is game over. Tommy Carmichael is a very bright person who, had he used his intelligence for good, probably would have been a much richer man than he is today. But it's not just cheaters with technical know-how that casinos have to look out for. Other criminals change the game by using sheer force. The heart of every casino is the cage, a highly secure area where money is counted and chips and tokens can be exchanged for cash. 
in the cage. This is run a lot like a bank, but honestly, this is more secure than any bank. This is where all the money is. So we take our security here more seriously than any other place. For years, cages were considered rock-solid fortresses, even though a few unarmed casino guards, a couple of cameras, and a dark reputation were their only protection. It was perceived that organized crime had a lot of influence in Las Vegas and that they were owners or part owners of all the casinos. Popular consensus was that anybody who robbed a casino would end up dead the next day, buried out in the desert someplace. But in the 1990s, corporations started building and buying casinos. Cages still had millions on hand, but security hadn't changed. And without the mythic layer of mob protection, the once impenetrable fortress became vulnerable. No one knew it, but a violent outside force was about to change the game of cage security forever. The Aladdin Casino. Tourists work the slots. Players huddle around the gaming tables. At 9 p.m., black and white surveillance cameras capture a suspicious group entering the casino. They've got masks on, they've got guns, they start yelling, hitting people, knocking people down. They make their way to the cage. The bandits are small enough to dive under the 15-inch clearance below the cage bars. They open up all the drawers, grab all the money they could, as quick as they could. As they ransack the cage, casino staff offer no resistance. They're not supposed to fight these guys. Just let them take it, back off. It's no amount of money is worth your life. The thugs inside the cage leap out and race for the door. In less than two minutes, the robbers bag 47 grand in cash. This was the first time anything like this had happened. A flat out takeover of the casino cage area. Casino cameras see it all, but after review of the grainy black and white footage, they still don't know the identities of the masked bandits. They could see enough skin color under their masks to know they were black, but nobody was gonna be able to identify them. We didn't have any real leads to go on. There's really no physical evidence that would lead us to anybody. Two days later, LAPD was serving 28 search warrants related to a gang homicide. The police rolled up at one of these locations, and a bag comes flying out, lands practically at their feet. They look in the bag, and there's a bunch of Aladdin Casino money wrappers in there. Of course, that's our first clue that the guys who robbed the casino had a connection to LA but no one is sure exactly what the connection is. The LAPD immediately calls Las Vegas police, and since the investigation has crossed state lines, the FBI gets involved. All three agencies focus attention on a potential LA gang connection, but nothing comes of it, and the investigation goes cold. Two months later, the Flamingo, another casino with easy access to the cage, is hit. Four guys come running in, guns out, all masked up, vault the counter, grab the money. They all leave, get in a stolen van, take off. It took less than two minutes, and they were out of there with $150,000. Once again, the robbers leave behind no clues, little evidence, and no suspects. Desperate to avoid a mass exodus of customers, Vegas increases camera coverage and adds security on casino floors. The reason that everybody was so concerned about this robbery series was that they didn't want it to affect tourism. They didn't want anybody not to feel safe in a hotel in Las Vegas. And that's what this gang was making people feel unsafe. They were unsafe. Nobody wants to go to a hotel that you know looks like you're in Baghdad. But there's no stopping the bandits. Two days later, they hit Harris. Only this time, they amp up the attack. Four young men come running in. They pistol whip a lady. They hit another guy in the head. Two of them vault the counter. They grab another guy by the hair, hold the gun to his head, while the two behind the counter rifle the drawers. Jump back over the counter, they all run outside with a little over $97,000.
they crash through a gate, and they go into the Harris parking garage where they switch to another vehicle. The police officer sees this van coming out with its lights off at 3 in the morning. He starts following it. The van takes off. The chase is on. They get the helicopter up. The squad cars converge. And there's a 20-minute high-speed chase through Vegas. The subjects ram a police car that's at a roadblock, lose control, hit a fire hydrant, crash into a telephone pole, and everybody scattered. Police canine units pursue on foot. 30 harrowing minutes later, they bust all four thieves, plus the getaway driver. Unmasked, authorities discover that the terrifying casino cage attackers are just teenagers from Los Angeles gangs, hoping to build up their street credibility. The gangs will use kids for a lot of stuff. They'll use them as lookouts. They'll use them as couriers. They'll use them to pass messages, sometimes make deliveries or carry money, because they know that even if they get caught, the kid will have no incentive to talk because he's, he won't be looking at that much time. He's a juvenile. Plus, the younger they were, the dumber they were to put themselves at this kind of risk. That means one thing to authorities. We didn't have the guys who had been setting this up and was responsible for robbery after robbery. So that's what we were trying to uncover. The cops put the squeeze on the attack crew, interrogating them for hours in search of the ringleaders. But whoever is running this dangerous scam has been careful. The teenagers don't even know the names of the guys they're working for. A year goes by. And it took so long, the time kind of worked in our favor because these gang members, they were continually getting in trouble with the law. And when they would get jammed up bad enough, they'd be looking for a way to get out. They'd be thinking, well, you know, I, I know a little bit about this casino robbery. So we got a lot of bits of information from a lot of people and we put the whole thing together. Authorities uncover not one, but two ringleaders behind the violent cage raids. Melvin Foster and Chet Govan are unlikely partners from rival Los Angeles gangs. Loyalty to the gang really goes out the window when it comes to making money. Melvin Foster was a member of the Los Angeles Bloods gang. He had gotten the idea for the robberies after he traveled to Vegas and recognized a serious flaw in casino cages. Melvin Foster was well aware that most of the casinos didn't have bars and stuff. They looked more like a bank counter, but there was a lot more money behind the counter than you would find at the typical bank. Foster had mapped out a plan. He started by choosing casinos with cages close to exits and with the fewest cameras and security guards. Foster was ready, but he wanted to increase his odds of success. For that, he needed a partner, someone street smart, someone like him. But who could he trust? Family. He turned to his cousin, Dion Chappelle. Chappelle suggested a partnership with her boyfriend from the rival Crips gang. His name was Chet Govan, who went by the street name Short Dog. In 1994 Los Angeles, on a normal day, these two gang members would kill each other before they would ever talk. Guys are supposed to be rivals, supposed to be trying to tear each other's head off, but next thing you know, they're involved in that kind of activity together. Foster had the mind, and Govan had the metal. They needed each other, even if no one could understand the partnership on the street. Foster and Govan used young gang members from LA's toughest neighborhoods to storm the Vegas casino cages unchallenged. Finding young men in the streets that were willing to get involved, especially if they thought they could make a quick buck, it was really easy because they know they're willing to go out and do something crazy. After the heist, the gang used two escape cars. The first was for the getaway from the casino. The second car was waiting in a parking garage. Then, they switched into that car with the money and headed to Los Angeles. The masterminds waited nearby. Chet Govan and Melvin Foster wouldn't be anywhere near the casino during the robbery. When they got word the heist was pulled off, Govan and Foster made their way back to South Central Los Angeles in their own car. This way, they would never be connected with either the robbers, the physical evidence from the robbery, or even the money. Incredibly. 
Foster and Govan didn't give a dime to the brazen young gang members who pulled off the heists. The guys they're working for are not planning on sharing it with them. So they'll use them up until they can't use them anymore. You know, they move on to the next youngster that will do something stupid for them. Once Foster and Govan are arrested, the two rivals quickly flip on each other. The authorities now have enough to put them away. Foster gets 18 and a half years in prison. Govan is sentenced to 22. The five men who we had caught after Harris robbery, they all pled, and they got between 10 and 18 years apiece. For Las Vegas, the robberies were game changers when it comes to cages. In today's modern casino, the cages are deliberately set in the back, far from exits, making a fast getaway virtually impossible. They are also being watched from every angle. I have more cameras per square foot in this area than anywhere in the casino. I've got 60 cameras in this small area. I have cameras embedded in the bars. But in addition to that, we're more vigilant in front of this cage than we ever were before. We have security that is staged here 24 seven, and not just one officer, several. The cage interior has also been revamped, making the money less accessible. Because those, those individuals were able to slide right into the cage, we, we had to look at that and say, that really didn't work, did it? It was a very glaring weakness that nobody had really thought of. But when it was demonstrated to us, at that point, all the bars came down lower so that somebody cannot do that anymore. The lowered bars are only the first new layer of protection. The initial door you walk in to get into the cage leads you into the chip bank area, where they're going to be conducting transactions, taking chips to the table, bringing chips back that have been redeemed from a game. Today, the cage is no longer an open area. It's a labyrinth of multiple rooms. Beyond that door, that's going to have a cage going into the main cage. But then next to that is going to be another door. So you go in one door, that door is going to close and lock behind you. Both doors can't be open at the same time. And then to get actual entry to the cage, you have to go through another door. And then usually behind that, we're going to have our count areas. So you're going to be going through three to four doors to get to the count area where we're actually counting the money. Still, in spite of all the new defenses the casinos put in place, there will always be another game changer who will come up with ways to beat the system. The only thing everyone in Vegas can bank on is that the battle against cheats will never end. Mm -hmm.